Lying in hospital for 16 months, I was dealing with the, the dual decisions on one hand to accept life as it was going to be in the wheelchair and on the other side, the hope side of the equation, what I could possibly do to walk again. You know, I'm not sort of finishing off my life sitting in a wheelchair. Do you know, so for me it's a case of, right, what I do here, how can I get myself, keep my body active, keep it mobile, keep it in a shape that if something comes, I'm ready for it. I used to be able to walk and see, and in 1998, just at a time when I was about to graduate, go and start a job in investment banking, and I was rowing for the university and also for Ireland, I lost my sight very suddenly in the space of two weeks. And I think I spent the, I think I was on an autopilot for about four years, just getting back to work, study, socialising, rowing, and then it really, uh, I suppose I, I felt like I was going to have to sit on the sidelines in the beginning and over the te following 10 years I rebuilt my identity as a competitor, racing in deserts, mountains, oceans and eventually over 43 days to the South Pole. And just about a year after getting back from the South Pole, when I felt unstoppable, it was then that I fell from a second story window onto the concrete below and, and broke my back, uh, leaving me paralysed from the, from the waist down. I was a motocross racer, off-road dirt rider for 25 years and 2015 I had a leg break and I was deciding, you know what, I've done enough of this biking. I'm retiring when I was 29 and I got sucked back in the following year and I had myself convinced I can't get hurt any more than what I have but in 2016 July came along and I was competing in an event in Athlone and it was the final sort of race of the day and it was the first lap of the race and a guy tried to pass me, he came in under me and brought the both of us down and whatever way I fell his bike landed on my back and I ended up with a T3 spinal injury what I tell everybody would be your nipple line, so from that point down I've limited movement or any kind of function. I remember exactly what it was like flying to Exobionics in, in California with the possibility of using one of these exoskeletons to stand and walk out of my wheelchair and at the same time thinking, well, is my sight going to prevent me from using this innovation? I, I remember I was with my dad in um, the Exobionics factory in, in uh, Berkeley, just outside San Francisco, and I, and I got into the device, strapped in, and the physios, there were two either side, and I was strapped up to the ceiling, and they pressed the button, and I leant forward, pushed up, and stood with, with a walker in front of me, two physios either side, and it was just, just to stand was nearly enough. Uh, I felt, I almost felt like, uh, felt like myself again, uh, and I was able to, I was able to give my dad a hug, uh, and he was the height that he should have been, which was, you know, about up to there on my, my chest, not as he is now, you know, up there and I have to reach up to give him a hug. Mm. So um, hugely emotional, hugely rewarding and, and just regardless of the physical benefits that came over time, the psychological impact of just standing up in the world is huge. The first time it was, it was like a real sort of daunting feeling because you've spent a lot of time sitting, you, you get up on your feet and it's like, you, you know, you kind of think, well, you feel about 10 feet tall and you're kind of going, that the ground's a long way down. And then, you know, because you've sat so long, it's like you don't realise your balance point. So that first getting up, it was like, whoa, I feel really tall. And you're just kind of taking in around you, you know, the surroundings at the new height from 
going from sitting back to standing, everything looked so high and it just was like a surreal feeling then, you know, taking that first step where you could nearly, you know, shut your eyes and nearly imagine that you're, you're back up and walking and, you know, even to this point, I've done it loads of times, but every time you walk up that hall, it's like, this is just how I picked your life to be, you know, before, before my accident. My job with the back really here is just to make sure Wayne doesn't lose his balance. Sometimes I can assist him and correct him, but he's pretty much in control of the process. So there's kind of sensors in the foot plates that once he stands on a leg, so say he stands on the left and then the right moves automatically. So once those sensors detect loading, they know he's, he's safe, his weight is on that leg, it'll hold him up and it'll automatically move the other leg. So if he wants to stop walking, say for instance, this is going to be your cue now, Wayne, to just stop. He just hangs on the back leg. It won't move until he loads the sensor on the front leg and then it steps automatically. Okay. So he's totally in control of that walk. So we would have people, you know, like, in terms of the progress that a, a person could make, say, who's rehabbing their walking or someone who's aiming to maybe get better on their feet, we'd have people who would be, would go from kind of full-time wheelchair users to then, say, being able to, like, walk around their house fully independently so they can kind of get to the point where they might need their chair out and about for distances, but they can park the chair when they go home and walk around the house um, you know, as normal. You know, maybe using a stick or a frame or that, or that kind okay. of thing. I guess everybody, and, and I would have been the same um, before my accident, you take life for granted, you take walking for granted. Um, you know, people that are walking every day, you know, they, they don't look at it as a, as a privilege, but, you know, for me, this exoskeleton getting walking is an unreal privilege and <laughs> maybe it's bad to say, but it's, it's the highlight of my life now every week, getting yeah. back up on my feet and, you know, just being able to watch your feet one step and past the other, you know, it's, it's just unreal. I've been walking in, in my EXO for 10 years. I've done over a, a million and a half steps uh, in the device. And very early on, I thought to myself, well, you know, this, this is, a, a, is a selfish endeavor. I don't want to be in the wheelchair, so I want to use all technology that I can to try and get out of the wheelchair. And you start asking yourself, well, what is it? Essentially, you're, you're exploring. You're exploring the fringes. So what is a legitimate argument for any kind of exploration if it's, if it's the, the privileged few who can access it? Um, and to answer that question, uh, I remain on a selfish endeavor to get out of my own wheelchair, yes. But when we find things that are interesting, we want to be able to bring those back to Ireland or out of research labs and get them available to people around the world who can't go on a research program in California. So part of what I've been doing with exobionics, exoskeletons and other devices is to try and create a centre here in Ireland at Dublin City University that people can come and access the device uh, without having to raise the couple of hundred thousand to buy the device. So we go from research where very few people can access uh, these interventions to trying to make it available to, to, to as many people who, who need it as we can. They'll never leave you that, you know, just experiencing that walking, you know, the feeling you get from being up on your feet, you know, that you're not sitting, you're not reliant on your arms, you know, your legs are taking over and, mm. and getting you moving, you know, and it's just, it's so hard to, you know, imagine not having the exo to, to be able to get that feeling. So we're, do, we're doing a wedding next year. Are you? We are, yeah. We're trying to decide if it's, um, you can't, this, this particular person, they can't walk out of the church because there's steps. So it's either a walk into the dining room or first dance. Yeah, so looking forward to that. 
Well, look, the reality is whenever people stand and walk and walk in these devices, the, the first thing that generally happens is that people start to cry. And if they're not crying, it's their partner. And uh, these moments of uh, deep emotion sort of reveal what's going on within the families of, of people who are paralyzed. So hugely emotional, it starts with that, and that's exciting. I, I love to see that, I love to hear the stories, I love to see the feedback and the testimonials that we get, but it really represents the meaning that this injury impacts people's lives, not just the injured person, but also the family. And when people can get a chance to get out of their wheelchairs, walk to feel what that's like, and to improve their physical condition and psychological condition, um, it's, you know, that's why we that's why we set it up. That's what it's all about. The reality is that all of these programs require the a combination of not just the people walking in the device, not just their families, not just universities, not just companies and scientists and technologists who are creating these interventions, but it requires funding. It requires people to back the programme, to get involved, to be part of the expedition team. And we need money, we need donors. The guy, it's, you know, I'm a glass half full type of guy. Mm. You know, I look at it that my walking days aren't finished yet. And I'm optimistic that someday I can be back on my feet and, and being able to walk on my own again.